This year, just under 2 million Americans will be diagnosed with cancer. Many will endure multiple CT and MRI studies and intensive medical care, including surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or immunotherapy. Unfortunately, many American cancer patients also face an unexpected adverse effect, financial toxicity. The costs of cancer are literally killing patients, but there is a clear solution. Patients diagnosed with cancer should not be responsible for any deductibles, copays, or other cost sharing. That was Ezekiel J. Emanuel, an oncologist as well as vice provost for global initiatives and co-director of the Healthcare Transformation Institute at the University of Pennsylvania. He was reading from his recent first opinion essay on why cancer patients shouldn't have to pay out-of-pocket costs. I'll bring you our conversation about cancer and the personal and health costs of financial toxicity after a quick break. I'm Jesse McWhorters, branded content editor for STAT. Recognizing the breadth and diversity of America's 53 million family caregivers, how can we better know and see these important unsung heroes? Lisa Wilson, head of caregiver advancement strategy and experience at United Healthcare, offers insights. Family caregivers are a cornerstone of our health system, but it can be challenging to support them in the moments that matter. United Healthcare is breaking down the barriers to identifying and engaging caregivers. For example, we're making it easy for caregivers to establish necessary HIPAA permissions and encouraging self-identification. The more we know about this population, the more we see them, especially early on in their caregiving journey, the better support we can provide. For more information, visit uhc.com slash caregiving. Welcome to the First Opinion Podcast. I'm Tori Bosch, editor of First Opinion. First Opinion is Stat's platform for interesting, illuminating, and provocative articles about the life sciences writ large, written by biotech insiders, healthcare workers, researchers, and others. Zeke, welcome to the show. It's my great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here. So I want to dive right in and ask to start, uh, what is financial toxicity and how does it affect cancer patients? Well, it's the impact of just the super high costs of every aspect of cancer care. The high cost of surgery, the high cost of chemotherapy, of radiation therapy, and the associated costs that get shifted to patients through deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, and all the additional out-of-pocket expenses for parking and whatever else just to get that care. And what we've seen is that that burden on patients keeps going up and up. And as a predictable consequence, uh, patients either stop their medical treatments, delay their cancer therapy, split their cancer pills, or simply forego uh, sometimes curative uh, therapy. I remember talking to a uh, patient uh, who was had cancer and simply couldn't afford the uh, whatever it was at that point, $12,000, I think, monthly uh, uh, injections. And he basically stopped taking them and said, you know, I'm older and I'd rather not bankrupt my family for a few extra months. You know, it seemed like a rational decision, but it also seemed horrible that any person had to be, especially in the richest country in the world, had to be put in a position of deciding, are you going to extend your life with standard uh, approved chemotherapies uh, or are you uh, going to uh, die early uh, because you don't want to bankrupt your family? That, that we, we shouldn't just have that situation in the United States. And bankruptcy, as you say, is a, a really genuine threat. I mean, you mentioned in the article that 40% of patients spend their entire life savings within two years of diagnosis. Yes. That first year is enormously expensive. When you're getting the diagnosis, you're getting the hopefully definitive 
surgical procedure. You might need radiation and chemotherapy on top of those things. Um, those are super expensive moments. Um, and yeah, cancer patients have to pay, continue to pay out, out of pocket. Um, and it's a big burden. As we know, many, many people in America don't have 400 spare dollars for an emergency, much less $6,000 for the cancer treatment that, you know, unexpectedly they suddenly need. So you, though, have a proposal for how to change that. Um, walk us through your idea. <laughs> Well, I was on a panel about two years ago, and we were talking about financial toxicity and how to think about it and the price of drugs and stuff. And I said, well, you know, there's a reason why we have deductibles and co-pays and co-insurance. And that deal reason is moral hazard. Uh, we have it because we don't want people just, you know, sort of using the system and using healthcare services like it's a luxury good. Someone else is paying for it. I'll then have these added goodies. Um, that makes sense where the medical services are discretionary, but it makes no sense where the medical services are necessary to save a life. And in cancer, you know, these services, whether it's a surgical procedure, it's a genetic test to determine what the treatment you get, it's a chemotherapy, they are necessary. Uh, they are determined largely by the doctor, not by the patient. Uh, and when someone gets diagnosed with cancer, uh, they shouldn't be responsible. There's no moral hazard here anymore, <laughs> um, unless there happen, you know, there are two equal treatments and they're choosing the more expensive because it's either, you know, they have some belief about it being better because it's more expensive or, um, it's, you know, maybe a little more convenient for them. Uh, and so I had this you know, literally in the course of a panel, it's not like I pre-thought this, in the course of a panel, I said, well, you know, from a financial standpoint, from the whole insurance idea standpoint, co-pays and deductibles make no sense in cancer because you're not dissuading people from a discretionary service. Um, and so we should just get rid of them. And why shouldn't we have them? Well, I sort of wrote up this idea, I passed it around. And then for some reason, which I'm still at a loss to say, I sort of forgot about it. And then we were going through my list of, of things that I, I want to clear the table because I'm starting a book. And, and we were going through the things that I hadn't cleared off the table. And one of my researchers said, well, you know, this is, there's this cancer op-ed, which you wrote a while ago, but you've never, you know, sort of finished it off and and uh, submitted it. And, and that's another thing on the table. So why don't we clear it off the table? And uh, thank God she said that. Uh, because I do think it's a, I, I think, you know, financial tactics is only getting worse. It's not getting better. Um, and uh, I do think uh, we need to begin having so systematic solutions to it, not charity events, either a GoFundMe or some pharmaceutical company saying, oh, you know, we'll, we'll uh, pay for your uh, uh, copay just in order to get the insurance company to pay the full price and things like that. I think we need some more rational approach to this. That is the most productive thing I've ever heard come out of a panel discussion. So congratulations. <laughs> well, uh, normally, things don't get accomplished at a panel. So that's amazing. <laughs> you know, and what I loved about this idea is it's something that seems sort of achievable, right? So many of the times we talk about healthcare policy in the U.S., it seems like it's just intractable, right? You know, there are, are two sides and never the twain shall meet. But this seems like something that could happen. So can you tell me a bit about what it would look like, practically speaking? You know, what would have to happen to make it take effect? And do you think the insurance companies would go for it? Well, I think it's um, uh, the main way to think about it is we have an out-of-pocket maximum, at which point the insurance companies just pick up the full freight and they often have reinsurance for these very expensive patients uh, to protect themselves from a super high unexpected costs on their part. Um, and basically it would work like you hit your out-of-pocket limit and now the insurance company has to pick up 100% uh, and it corresponds to diagnosis of cancer. Now, we, need, we do need some protections and I don't think insurance companies are, are crazy to be worried 
there are some discretionary choices. And I, in the article, I point out, you know, look, radiation is, you know, you've got proton beam, you've got cyber knife, you've got IMRT. So we've, we've got choices to be made. Um, and insurance companies should only be liable when the most cost effective treatment is being offered. Uh, and I think that's an entirely reasonable limit. And the person who should bear the responsibility for that seems to, for making that choice, seems to me the oncologist. It's largely not the patient making the, the choice of, you know, this is your chemotherapy flavor we're going to give you, uh, right? But for very many chemo, the many uh, cancers, there's multiple chemotherapies that are approved by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN. And we could say, all right, insurance companies, you're responsible for the most cost effective. And, you know, this would make patients ask their doctors, make doctors choose the most cost effective because it's financially beneficial to the patient. It would have the added benefit, I think, of uh, lowering uh, uh, overall costs for the insurance companies. Um, now, would they have to pay something? Yes. I mean, that's the, the whole point here is they're probably, uh, I estimate in the paper, probably in the first year, something like $5 billion uh, of out-of-pocket expenses that would have to be covered. So it's not nothing, um, but it is about 2.5% of total oncology costs. Um, and it, again, it may have this extra uh, externality benefit for the insurance company that might actually lower some of the uh, uh, expensive chemotherapies being selected by oncologists, expensive radiation therapies being utilized. Um, so uh, because of patient pressure on their on the system. And so I think uh, it's probably lower than $5 billion a year. Um, again, it's a real amount of money spread out over all the different payers, um, but it's definitely a manageable amount of money and a big benefit, especially if patients get treatment and take the right kind of treatment so that we're not having patients forego medical care for financial reasons. And do you think oncologists would be willing to, to take on this burden to help figure out what the cost-effective approach is? Oh, um, given the volume, um, uh, both in terms of amount and in terms of loudness of the concern in the oncological community about financial toxicity, um, I would be shocked if they weren't willing to do the right thing here. I would I'm 100% sure organizations like ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, would definitely get behind an uh, idea like this. Uh, I'm sure a lot of cancer patient advocacy groups uh, would get behind an idea like this. Um, I do think, you know, if there is a major objection here, it's less from the oncology community and more from the other <laughs> chronic very expensive illnesses. Um, uh, and I don't think, I mean, uh, as I say in the article, that's a completely legitimate concern. I am against, and I, I want to go on record, I'm totally against the idea of salami slicing who gets benefit. We do this constantly in American healthcare. Um, and as I, again, point out in the article, $35 insulin means diabetics are getting a preference. Um, uh, but that's the way we approach things in America, unfortunately, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, you got to sometimes be pragmatic to achieve incremental progress. Um, uh, and I'm not saying cancer is a more serious illness than, say, multiple sclerosis or ulcerative colitis or other illnesses that have very high uh, financial toxicity. It just happens to be, you know, the one I know best, and it also happens to affect more people than others, given the fact that, as you just had me read, 2 million people a year roughly get cancer, and 600,000 uh, people a year die of cancer. Um, so I think it, it, there's a rationale. It may not be the best rationale, but from a pragmatic standpoint, it may be the only 
way we're going to make progress you know, on this issue by taking one area first. Right. I mean, and so you can see an argument, too, that cancer advocacy has been far ahead sometimes other illnesses, perhaps just because it's so scary, so deadly, and so common. So, I mean, I wonder if you can see an argument that if it works in cancer, then it can be replicated elsewhere, perhaps. So it's more of a case study than carving out an exception. <laughs> uh, except with two million people, $5 billion, that's not exactly case study uh, right. terrain. But <laughs> that's I, true. Uh, I, I, do, I, do, I, I think you're right, which is the tradition in America is you start with one thing and then you expand it. And uh, I think that is partially my idea. If we can do it in cancer, we can make it work in cancer. Um, yes, uh, that will serve as a demonstration that this kind of policy makes sense. And we can still have the high deductibles and co-pays to discourage discretionary services that aren't necessarily essential. Um, but where they are essential uh, for serious chronic illnesses, we can um, dispense with them. And, you know, certainly a, a time-honored tradition, so to speak, within any kind of healthcare is arguing with an insurance company over what's medically necessary. You know, they only sometimes want to approve things that they say are as effective, but patient and advocates and doctors will say they're not actually as effective. Um, do you anticipate those sorts of arguments continuing under this framework? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, again, if you if the idea is uh, they are responsible, they, the insurance companies, are responsible for the most cost-effective treatment. There will be some argument. Well, in this case, the patient really needs the proton beam and not the IMRT because, uh, uh, you know, the, it, it's near a major blood vessel and we have to be very, very precise. Um, so I think that is likely to continue. Um but I don't, it, hopefully the volume would be less, the first thing. And second of all, I do think that there is going to be this interest on patient side once they know uh, that, you know, they don't have a copay if the most cost effective treatment is selected. They will, uh, they will, I think, pressure oncologists to practice and change their routines in the right way. And by the way, the same thing works for some adjunctive procedures, you know, that aren't the chemotherapy, but you might need uh, uh, for other reasons, whether they're antiemetics, uh, uh, et cetera, pain medications, getting the most cost effective uh, uh, treatment would be very, very, uh, there'd be a lot of pressure to do that. So now, how exactly do we get the ball rolling on something like this? You know, especially in this political environment where it feels like everything becomes fraught in ways we can't always game out. Uh, you know, is this something that ha we would require legislation? Is it about getting the insurance companies to just do it? You know, what's the way to get started? I do think it's probably something that's going to, you're only going to get the ball rolling by legislation. And the most effective thing it would in variably be some combination of the professional society, ASCO, the American Society, uh, uh, American Cancer Society, and the patient adv advocacy groups. Um, I think that is the way. But I, I do think cancer is one of those areas where uh, there's bipartisan support in, on the Hill for advances related to cancer, including advances on the finances. And you could see uh, that um, in various ways related to the Inflation Reduction Act and other uh, things, you know, financing of the NIH uh, for research. This is one of those things where it's not just research, but it's actually implementation. Um, and I do think that this is the kind of thing, you know, you're not blue or red when you get cancer. <laughs> um, and I do think it's a uh, kind of thing that um, uh, conservative consti conservative uh, politicians can re recognize their constituents are particularly hard hit, especially lower income, poor uh, rural people. And similarly, I think it's a kind of thing that a lot of progressive Democrats want to see happen because they're against these high deductibles, high co-pays situation because they 
are inhibiting people from getting the therapy uh, they want. And, and, you know, these are uh, people who believe uh, healthcare should be a right and everyone should get uh, the same very high quality care, which, you know, is, is something I'm totally on board with. Now, you are the author of several books, including your most recent book, Which Country Has the World's Best Healthcare? So I'm curious how writing that book might have informed your thinking on this topic. Uh, well, it's informed my thinking, actually, uh, on a lot of aspects of the copay deductible situation in America, because um, one of the things that's different in other countries, first of all, is no one has uh, the deductible and copay levels we do. Um, the notion of high deductible just doesn't exist in other places. Second, many countries, Norway, Germany, have protections for people who have chronic illnesses. Uh, either they do get rid of the copays or they bring them down to, okay, you, your copay is 1% of your income. And let's just say, you know, 60,000 or 70,000 is the, um, average income in America. That means the copay at 1% or 2% would be $700, not $6,000. Uh, the second thing is they have a very consistent approach to try to look at people who are burdened by their healthcare situation and try to relieve their burden. As I mentioned, if you have a chronic illness in many countries, you don't have a copay or deductible or you hit a very low maximum. Um, I would say parenthetically here, uh, Tori, um, one of the things that I've noted is in many, many countries, there are no copays or deductibles for children, period. Um, and in Germany, for example, you don't pay, uh, the employer doesn't pay, and um, uh, the employee doesn't pay a higher rate if they have a family insurance plan. So covering children is essentially, from the employee standpoint, free. Um, and that, I think, means you socialize those costs. And basically I'm saying the same thing here. Let's socialize the copay and deductible, spread it out over across everyone for these serious kind of illnesses. And I think that ethically is the right thing to do. That's why we have insurances to spread the costs for those people who, unfortunately, the 10% of people who really use most of the healthcare dollars. Um, and that's, you see it just much more effectively put into place in European countries. And I was, I'm not sure this was, it was on my mind when I made the original suggestion to get rid of copays and deductibles, but it certainly was the case that doing the book, looking at other countries, you do get overwhelmed by, no other country has these variable prices we do, you know, depending on who your insurer is, you're paying a different price the high deductibles we have, and they try to socialize some of the costs for people who can't pay like children. Um, and th those things are, I think, the kind of reforms we could use more of in our country. But maybe we should stay away from the word socialize. I just worry a little, <laughs> little bit about that. <laughs> yes, I forgot the PR disadvantage of using that term. Oh, we can brainstorm some other options, perhaps. <laughs> Um, can you tell us what country does have the best health care or do we have to read the book? Well, you should read the book. And actually, <laughs> what, one of one of the gratifying uh, uh, things about this book is that uh, uh, it's outsold many of my other books unexpectedly to me. As I say in in the introduction to that book, I came to it because the public kept asking me this question. It was like, well, which other country, you know, has the best system? And what, you know, is it basically a question of what can we learn from them that we should be doing in our healthcare system? And uh, I, I think the, the it's been a surprising response to uh, that. And I will say, you know, I don't identify a single country and, and it's not because I'm trying to be coy. It's because one of the things that, becomes obvious when you really begin to sit back and think about comparing countries is there's not a single metric. You have multiple metrics and those multiple metrics, not everyone scores the top in, uh, not everyone, no country scores the top in all those metrics. It really depends upon which of set of metrics you want to emphasize, you know, low overall cost, low cost to people at the point of care, you know, free choice, uh, higher quality in some chronic diseases like cancer. 
innovation in delivery as well as in technology um, and you know good financing for long-term care. I end up identifying four countries, the Netherlands, Germany, Norway, and Taiwan, because they each emphasize different combinations of those metrics. Um, you know, for example, the Netherlands and Germany have good long-term care financing. No other country really does. Every other country, it's sort of wheel put together in a makeshift way. Um, the free choice, you know, Germany has a uh, free choice of any doctor, any hospital, anywhere in the country. And by the way, you want to see 10 orthopods for that bum shoulder of yours? You can see 10 orthopods in a day for that bum shoulder of yours. Yeah, shocking to, to most of us. Um, Netherlands, very uh, it's a country probably second only level of innovation in terms of delivery system and other things compared to the United States. Um, they really, the, the Dutch are, are quite innovative. Overall, low total health care costs with high satisfaction, that's Taiwan. But you go to their hospitals and, you know, they still have a lot of four people to a, bed, to a room uh, situation. Um, and their rooms, let me just say, um, you know, they're not nearly as luxurious as American hospital rooms. It reminded me more of a, uh, uh, of a dormitory. Each country has a trade-off uh, for uh, what they do, and each country excels in certain things and, and not in others. And the United States does excel in a few things, but we are not doing well in many more things than we excel in. Um, so I think that's uh, the consequence. Well, I'll certainly have to buy the book after this because I do. Every time I meet someone from another country, the first thing I want to say is, tell me a story of your healthcare system because um, it often feels a little bit like a fairy tale sometimes, yeah. depending on where they're from. On the other hand, you know, there are, uh, you know, I rank the Dutch system high. And I will just say, if you talk to non Dutch people who are getting their healthcare in the Netherlands for whatever reason, they're living there, they're consulting. Um, they often res re regret it. They don't like the Dutch system. And one of the reasons they don't like the Dutch system is they have a very strong primary care gatekeeper model and a very strong philosophy of, eh, your body will take care of yourself. So when they <laughs> expect, I'm going to go to the doctor, I'm going to get a prescription for something, the Dutch are like, you know, suck it up. <laughs> It'll get better all on its own. We don't need to intervene. And uh, you can't go to that specialist unless I write the prescription or you're going to pay full freight for that visit. And again, I think these are things that, yeah, I mean, you know, some people think it's very valuable that they can just go to the specialist without going to the primary care doctor. But the Dutch don't have that kind of system. So I do think that, again, there are trade offs about what kind of characteristics you really want. And no system I have seen has them all. <laughs> Um, and uh, there is one, I would say, big advantage of the Norwegian system. There are lots of advantages, but one of them that is very clear is uh, it's very good for doctor lifestyle. And the, the panel doctors have are about half of American panels. So uh, the primary care panel is about uh, 1,000 to 1,200, whereas our panels are, even in places like Kaiser, typically around 2,000. Um, so... And by panel, you mean the number of patients they're seeing? The number of patients they're responsible for. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and, you know, one of the consequences is uh, doctors tend to stop working at about 4 or 4.30 in the Norway. Well, that means getting to a your doctor after hours is uh, might be a little more challenging than it is in other countries. There, I think the coverage system the Dutch have is, is very positive. Um, and, you know, they have a a big collection of doctors together that provide coverage and access to the medical records. Um, so it, um, again, each system has its advantages and disadvantages. And you, so speaking of trade-offs, I want to go back quickly to, to the proposal um, and this idea of no more co-pays. Um, and I'd just like to s get back to that idea you mentioned of salami slicing, which um, is making me hungry. I think I'm going to have to have a hoagie for dinner since I'm in yeah. Philadelphia. But, you know, are you interested in promoting 
universal health care? And do you think a step like this, the salami slicing, is a way toward it? Or do you worry, and we talked about this a little bit, but do you worry that it could end up making it maybe harder? If people say, well, we've got cancer covered now mostly for people, why do we need to worry about universal health care? It's to some degree, I think, an empirical question, really, Tori. So if this proposal were to be enacted for cancer, and it came in at less than $5 billion a year, call it $3 billion a year, net, net. Um, I actually think that would propel it further and faster because it didn't overrun the estimate. And obviously the Congressional Budget Office would have to do a, a sort of serious financial estimate of it. It didn't overrun the financial estimate. Um, and it does lead to more cost-effective treatment. I think that actually would propel this idea further and faster than otherwise. There is a case, which I didn't put in the article, but we can talk about it here, um, end-stage renal disease. So chronic renal dialysis was uh, developed in the early 60s uh, with the shunt, uh, AV shunt, and then uh, you could get chronic dialysis three times a week. And the problem is that dialysis facilities were limited. People had to pay at that time $160 per dialysis treatment. Um, and eventually uh, we recognized there were lots of people who needed it, but couldn't get it because of the financial burden. Um, and Congress ultimately uh, enacted or made Medicare pay for this one disease, end-stage chronic renal disease, and it never really expanded. They have added uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, but it really never expanded. Um, it didn't become, you know, Medicare for all. It was just Medicare for people with chronic renal failure. Um, and the reason there it was purely financial. It turned out all the estimates were grossly inadequate. Why were they grossly inadequate? Because there were way more people that had chronic renal failure and that doctors were willing to put on dialysis than it were estimated and the costs zoomed, especially because we had a lot of proliferation of for-profit companies that really figured out how to get a lot of resources. We didn't bundle it. We didn't say, all right, we're gonna pay this amount for all the uh, uh, dialysis and associated costs. There are a whole series of disincentives preferencing transplant, even though it's way better for patients than being on dialysis. Um, uh, but I think the cost estimates, you know, meant government wasn't going to do this, this one, this expansion again. Um, and, uh, I, on the other hand, if my idea is right and my sort of back in the envelope calculation that this is about $5 billion a year, um, that could be, uh, and, you know, it doesn't go over it. It, it comes in under that could be a justification. Again, I think this is mostly an empirical question, not a in principle uh, philosophical issue. Well, I really hope they take it up because it would be fascinating to see um, what transpires. Uh, Zeke Emanuel, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Tori. This has been a wonderful discussion. We got off into things like other countries' healthcare systems I didn't anticipate. <laughs> Never know what's going to happen on the First Opinion Podcast. <laughs> I guess that's right. I have to come prepared for anything. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the First Opinion Podcast. It's produced by Teresa Gaffney. Alyssa Ambrose is the senior producer, and Rick Burke is the executive producer. I love to hear from listeners, so please let me know which First Opinion contributors you'd like to hear on the show or what topics the column and the podcast should take on. You can do that by sending me an email at first.opinion at statnews.com. And if you have a minute, please be sure to leave a review or rating on whatever platform you use to get your podcasts. And until next time, I'm Tori Bosch, and please don't keep your opinions to yourself. <laughs>